Welcome everyone to episode two of Small Town Black Man. Let's talk. Um, I'm very excited for episode two and my new panelists tonight. Um, there are a uh, couple of housekeeping things. Um, first of all, I'd like to let everybody know that we got some really nice feedback from episode one, uh, particularly from teachers, and um, that was really exciting and um, really nice to hear. Um, so I appreciate everybody that took part and viewed episode one and shared with your friends. Um, I wanted to remind everybody the heart of what we're doing here is basically to educate our neighbors and um, for our... Um, black citizens, particularly our black male citizens that we value very much that have the floor and get to share um, some of their um, situations they found themselves in in their life that um, many people may not relate to and that need to be told for all of us to have better understanding and empathy um, and hopefully to begin a dialogue one with another. Um, I'd like to also say that what we're doing here is not a competition with anybody present or past, and it's just strictly um, friends and a platform to give voice to um, history and um, current issues, and um, we will not be criticizing particularly individuals. Um, we want to be respectful of everybody, and it's absolutely not divisive in nature. So. Um, the things that are shared here are, are shared to benefit all of us and for us to learn from them. I would like to uh, read another quote from Benjamin Watson that uh, Emily Allen so graciously chose um, for me. And he says in his book, Under Our Skin, quote, The racial divide is about the reality each side sees. Each side believes its view is true reality. And we can't understand why the other side doesn't see the same thing and understand our reality, end quote. Again, I really recommend that book. If you're interested in this subject and you have a lot of questions, it's it's excellent resource. It's called Under Our Skin, again, by Benjamin Watson. Um, our next episode will be over um, the workplace and careers, and that will be in a couple of weeks. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to call in for our panelists, you may do that at 825-3245. There are some friends on the line waiting for your call. And um, you may also um, <coughs> write those questions on the Facebook Live feed. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome our new panelists, and they're going to share a bit about mm -hmm. themselves. And Mr. Parks is going to start. Hello, my name is Mac Parks. And... I am originally born and raised in Gary, Indiana. Spent a lot of time staying in Kalamazoo, Michigan and Indianapolis, Indiana. So I have a lot of point of views on different people out here. And um, I've known about Connersville now for 15 years. My name is Steve Malachi Jr. I'm born and raised here in Connersville. Uh, so I'm a civilian. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to say I've been in Indianapolis for 20 years. Uh, but my heart is always here in Connersville, um, and I try to do as much in the community uh, as I can with being in Indianapolis, uh, with Joey and doing the dribble over drugs. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Joey Laughlin. I'm your Fayette County Sheriff. Uh, I'm a husband and father of three and co-chair of the dribble over drugs uh, program, and uh, happy to be here. Hi, I'm Tommy Williams. Uh, I'm one of your counselors, councilmen at large, and um, I'm married to Emma Howard Williams, and I'm really happy to be here. All right. Get this All started. right. Well, I would like to begin off by touching on a little couple of different bases. I'll start it off in a, in a, in a positive movement. So, once, one, once upon a time, I was out of town when this took place, but I heard so much about it. So, my child was at home, which is at Xavier Parks, and he had no knowledge that this was going to happen. So, um, Officer Clint Brown, Josh Tudor, um, Cal Miller, um, Cal McMurray, and Beck Becker, they all showed up one night out of the clear blue sky, and 
rewarded my son with with gift cards and so many great things, etc. And just for having great good grades. They heard about he was on the honor roll, so they made it their, their way to come over and shed a lot of light with my son. They gave him so many things like, you know, money and t-shirts and gift cards and Clint Brown even saw my son playing basketball with his friends. He he hopped out and put his gun up and, and jumped out there and played basketball with them. And Clint Brown just like last summer, he came and picked my son up and took him fishing for the very first time. Sorry, I didn't have time to do it. <laughs> I'm not a fisher. But um he really had a great he really had a great time mm. and um he loved it and he he think the most and the best of Clint Brown and everyone else. So to reward them back for what they did, me and my wife, Anya, e, Anya Parks now, sorry, that was Magni. <laughs> <laughs> me and Anya Parks, she, um, we got Xavier and we took them up to the police station and we bought cookies, brownies, pizza, pop, and we just had one big dinner with all of them. And we sat down and shared so many stories like things that touches our lives and um, things that we can come together to improve as far as the community. And we came up with so many great ideas that we're actually looking forward to doing that once again. We just have to plan it out and, and make a day for that. And um, hopefully next time we do it, we can have even more people involved because it was a great experience. Yep. And on a side note, so that was a good thing that happened. So on the bad note, what happened on another whole day, another whole episode. Um, once upon a time, it was a, it was an altercation going on outside of my home. And it was a Caucasian couple, and they were out fighting. Why, I do not know, but I came out to calm the situation down because the gentleman was putting his hands on the female, which was very wrong. I do not condone that at all. And while that was going on, a state trooper passed by. When he passed by, out of nowhere, he jumped out and he asked me, what's my name? Um, let me see your driver's license. And I'm trying to tell him, no, this is the situation over here. So he proceeded to just stay on me and the couple walked away. So now it's just me and the officer and he's wondering about my information. Come to find out at that present time, my license was suspended. So... Throughout that time, I'm like, I was really, I was really bothered by that. So I didn't know, should I make a report about this or no? I don't know who's who friend, you know what I mean? That's the first thing that I think as being a black individual. I don't know who's friends with who, so I don't want to step on the wrong toes and then find myself or my child in the mm -hmm. situation. So I proceeded and went on to make the, um, made the, the report. And when I made the report, I noticed that same officer passed by my house two to three times and I caught him two, I mean, we, looked, we locked eyes two times and he gave me the, the, the meanest look anybody can ever give a person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. But after that time, I just, I didn't even make no more situation out of it because I didn't, therefore I'm like, there, there it is. I'm caught in a situation that I didn't want to be in. So to close it out, I was driving one day and he noticed me and we was looking eye to eye. So he waited till I turned, had my seatbelt on, I mean, had my seatbelt on, had my turn signal on, stayed at the stop sign for three seconds and turned like I was supposed to do. He pulled me over because he knew I didn't have a license, but by that time I had gotten all my situations, all my information up to date like I was supposed to. So it troubled him, and I saw it in his eyes, it troubled him that he had to come back and give me my license back and tell me have a nice day. He just knew he had me. He knew he had me. And at that point, I was really frustrated and I was mad, but I learned that you just got to look over that stuff. You know what I mean? You, you have to look over it. I know that we can act out in a rage and, 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 and just go crazy, but it takes a real individual with a strong mind and, and a blessing heart to get over certain situations, but still you have the right to, to voice your opinion. So never feel bad about voicing your opinion. It's just a, a communication thing. More communication is, I think, a better way to solve this situation. And that was my, 
that was my things I have been through. I've been through more, but I don't want to take up the whole time, so the next person can take it. We might get back to that. I will go. Uh, once again, my name is Tommy Williams, and uh, and I'm say Councilman Williams. Now, I want to talk about um, our community and talk about how I came to this community. Um, 17 years ago, I've been in the military. I've been for eight and a half years. I've been all over the world. I've seen beautiful places, lovely places, great places. And then I met my wife, which she's beautiful. She's great. That's a joke, guys. I mean, she's all of that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, no, I'm right? still working in, this, in the city of Monroe, Ohio. So when I first met her, she told me she was from Connorsville, Indiana. So I, the next day I looked on the map, I said, where's Connorsville? I didn't see it on the map. <laughs> so therefore, That's true. I uh, <laughs> said I want to visit the town where she's from. So I came to this town, and when I came to this town, and first thing I noticed was the town was really, really great. I mean, it was friendly people. Uh, I met some law enforcement uh, that was awesome. And, you know, you don't, you don't meet law enforcement officers that, uh, that's, that's normally speak to you. Hey, how you doing, sir? You know, I'm like, wow, that's pretty good there. That's awesome. And... And some of the things that, that I realized about Connorsville that my wife and I had to choose, like, where are we going to put our roots down? So we could have moved back to Monroe, Ohio, but we realized that we want to be able to, you know, save money and have the best choices, best opportunity for our three boys. So therefore, I'm not going to take all the time, guys. So therefore, we decided that we wanted to move to Connorsville, Indiana, because the property, the homes, a very reasonable price. The taxes are very reasonable. Anyone should, you know, be happy to be able to move in a town like this here and buy a home for seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars. In the state of Ohio, in Monroe, the house would have cost us $180,000, $200,000. So we weighed the option, say, do we want to pay that much? Do we want to pay that, that much taxes? Or do we want to, uh, do I have to, do, should I commute? So I decided to commute because I love the city. It was friendly people here. Uh, the, the policeman, like I said earlier, the policeman was friendly. And I found a church that I really enjoyed, Orange Christian Church. That's the church my wife has been going to for almost 20 years. So I really enjoyed that church. And so by finding all this goodness balled up in, 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 in one area here in Connorsville, which is a lot, versus other cities, other towns where you can live. But you're not going to get all the flavor that it's here in Connorsville. And a lot of people don't realize that. There's a lot of flavor here that we have to uh, be able to offer other people the opportunity to find that flavor. So I'm going to stop here until later on. Hopefully I get a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, again, I'm Steve Malachi Jr. A lot of you guys knew my dad, uh, Stephen Malachi Sr. Um, he was a pillar in this town. Um, he gave back to the community every chance he could, mm -hmm. give the shirt off his back a lot of the times, um, and wouldn't, I mean, he would give his last dollar to somebody else before he would spend it himself. Um, so we grew up uh, with that value um, that you always look out for your neighbor, you always look out for others, you know, and always try to put others before you put yourself. Um, so that was instilled in me at an early age. So growing up here in Connorsville, um, 
I had a lot of, you know, great teachers growing up. Uh, Mrs. Morris um, really changed my life. Uh, Mrs. Miller in second grade really changed my life. Um, that I'll never forget those people, you know, and they made me the person I am today. Uh, um, without getting emotional, uh, they made me the person that I am today, you know, mm -hmm. along with my father and my mother. Um, but I, you know, like I can remember, you know, going out for media and, you know, and, and not knowing if I was good enough, you know, or I had the proper literature skills. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Morris came to me and she said, honey, you're smarter than any of these kids in this class. You know, quit putting yourself second mm -hmm. just because of being here in Connersville, you know, um, it was kind of like an identity crisis, being black and white. You know, I had black friends and I had white friends. And my white friends didn't hang out with me when I was around my black friends and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got to my sophomore year and I was pretty much over it. You know, I just said, you know what, hey, you're going to accept me for who I am. If you don't, don't come around me. You know, and I didn't, at this point in my life now, I'm like the friends that are my friends are friends to the end. You know, um, and then I got people that are in my life that are, you know, not good for me. So I've tried to cut those people out. But everybody that I've ever, you know, been a friend with in Connersville, I'm always friends with. You know, like they can call me up and we ain't talked in 10 years and we'll be right back to where we left off. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you don't find that in other cities or, or any other area. You know, I went to Cancun one time and ran into somebody from Connersville. <laughs> you know, we're everywhere. We branch out, you know. <laughs> Um, and it's easy for us to adapt in bigger cities because of this community that we have. Um, you know, and I haven't lived here in 20 years, but when I come back, it's nothing but love. You know, I've never come back and had a situation to where I'm uncomfortable, you know, or somebody's, you know, threatening me or anything like that. Um, one, you know, my friend's Joey, so I'll just turn him in. But, <laughs> um, but no, I just, I mean, in real talk, you know, like I've had some experiences here that, you know, if I were somewhere else, I would have never gotten those experiences. You know, I would have never gotten the opportunities. You know, I've had teachers that, you know, were like, hey, you're a hell of an athlete and you're a great man. You know, who? nobody does that in Indianapolis. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, they just don't. They don't put the effort into kids like that, like they do here in, in Connorsville. And, um, you know, and it's a good thing and a bad thing because growing up here, I was kind of coddled. And then when I went to my <laughs> freshman year of college, I was lost, you know, like because I actually had to do the work and I actually had to, you know, to study and, you know, and so um, with that being said, you know, like I had some great, some great situations here that made me who I am. Um, I had one bad situation um, here in Tin Town where uh, I just left playing, playing ball and I got pulled over right in front of my house and the cops, you know, it was me, my cousin Sam McIntyre and our girlfriends were in the back. And they told us, put your hands on the dash, put your hands on the dash, they had their guns out. I'm like, what is going on? You know, at this point, I'm probably 17 years old. Um, and I, like I said, I just came from playing at the bowl. So I was like, well, what's going on? I just left the bowl. They're like, no, you pulled a gun on somebody. Oh you know, um, we, you'll get out of the car. Where's the gun at? Where's the gun at? Threw me on my car, was yelling at, you know, profanities at me. Um, my cousin's crying, you know. I'm pretty sure the girls in the back were crying, you know. And um, so they take me in handcuffs into my home. My mom was the only one home because, if you know, my dad was a DJ and did coaching and everything else. So my mom, they come in. I got handcuffs on. My mom's like, what is going on? She knew the officers, and she told the officers, she, you know who his father is? And they were like, yes, ma'am. She's like, if I was you, I'd get those damn handcuffs off of him then before you lose your job, you know? And so they took the handcuffs off me. Um, they told my mom why they pulled me over because they said I had a gun. You know, my mom was like, we don't condone that kind of, you know, ignorance in this house. So, you know, I know my son doesn't have a pistol. He doesn't have drugs either, you know? And so the officers, you know, apologized to my mom. Uh, I had to take my friends home, you know, I couldn't go out after that. My mom was really distraught, you know, and, um, and told me to stay inside. So, of course, my dad went down to the police station the next day and took care of that, you know, let the police officers know, one, you know, he's 17 years old. You don't treat him, you know, like he's done something. You know, you, you investigate. That's your job. Investigate, find out what's going on, and then, you know, do, do what you need to do. You do your dil due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like, like I said, it's, I usually have good, instance, good situations with everybody in the, in the area, you know, or in, in Connorsville. Um, me and my brother... I mean, you, we grew up fighting, but that was just because, like I said, 
what we're doing here is trying to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. You know, back then, ignorance is always taught. It's, it's, you know, you're not going to, you don't come out of the womb ignorant and, you know, and racist. You come out and then your parents instill those into you, you know, and that's what was going on. And a lot of times when I would get in fights, you know, because somebody called me a name or somebody spit on me, then, you know, like I would fight. And then the next day they'd be like, oh, hey, you want to be friends? Like, no, we just got in a fight yesterday and you said this and this. Well, yeah, then I went home and talked to my dad. He said I was wrong. Well, which is it? You know, you can't be on both sides of the fence. So with that being said, you have to dig deep inside yourself and you have to hold yourself accountable for your, for your own actions. Your parents can teach you and your parents can tell you this and tell you that. But you have to be the one to know what's right and what's wrong. Oh, yeah. Uh, I got a story uh, that to me kind of, um, it, it didn't, ch it changed my perception of some people, and it involves a, a mutual friend of Steve and I's uh, that was a, a Sam McIntyre's name's, uh, nickname's Mackie. Mackie, right. Mackie. Me and Mackie were hanging out one day, and he's like, man, I, I want to go swimming. I said, well, I knew a buddy, so I called him, so like, hey, me and Mackie's cruising town, can we come swimming? Yeah, come on over. So we end up going over uh, to this individual's grandparents' house, and we walked in, and we were all good. And I seen my buddy get pulled in the other room by his grandparents. I'm like, what's, what's going on? Mm. And nothing was shared at that time. We end up going swimming. Everything was good. And later, I asked that friend, I said, hey, what was that all about? And you went there with your grandma kind of freaked out. Well, they were just uh, they, they were just uncomfortable, and they they didn't they didn't know that our friend was black. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, what does that matter? What did it matter? Because it didn't matter to me and my friend at all. Right. But you know, it was something as as we swam and hung out, everything was fine, and it was just as to follow up on Steve's point, you know, that ignorance. Uh, I see that uh, in each generation. You would hope, but we know it still exists. But um, that, that, that would come away. Um, a, a friend of mine, we were discussing something, and he was talking about how his son, uh, they were watching a, a, a boxing match or UFC or something, and it was an African-American man against a Caucasian man. He said, who, who do you want to win? Expecting an answer, a certain answer. And he said, the guy in the red shorts. And yeah. that to him was like, okay, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're there <laughs> with him. Mm -hmm. So I kind of did the same test with my kids. It was, on, it was wrestling yeah. instead. And yeah. I can't remember who was wrestling. And I was like, who do you want to win? And, they said, and I thought, that's good. That's, that's, that's a step. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. We're on the, and, and that just has to, you know, it is a, a learned behavior. <laughs> Another quick story. In a, and, and, and two stories that I have and, and where people say, well, there's no racism in Fayette County or Connorsville. I do think it is a unique uh, environment here, and I do I, I don't see a lot of it, but I, I'm I, you know I've not been involved in those situations often. But this is a kid with something that troubled me, and as an adult, I wish I could go back and mm. pull little Joey away. <laughs> we were all playing at my grandparents' house outside, and our friend I won't say his name. I don't want to embarrass him, or maybe he didn't want that story told. But uh, <laughs> it was a, a African American buddy of mine. We were all playing. We always rode bikes. It was up on uh, Maple Street. We all hung out all the time. There was a new kid in, that had moved in, and we were in the front yard all playing, and he walks out, and he goes, you got to leave. I said, who, who's got to leave? He's got to leave. And the kid proceeds to say the N-word and says, my dad doesn't like N-words to play. I don't, I'm not allowed to play. And I, and I sat there and went. And I watched my buddy get on his bike and ride away, and I just sat there. I was shocked. And unfortunately, I, I was eight, nine years old, and I stayed there and played. And as an adult, I would go, oh, I wish I could go back to me and go, go with your buddy. Yeah, Leave. Right. This is wrong. If you can't mm -hmm. play, I can't yeah, play, right? Yeah, and it was just, and those are two incidents, you know, that, that I seen that, you know, just just turned my stomach, you know, and it's like, how, why are we just, we're just not, you know, Steve and I are, are really good friends. It's like, it just, that this doesn't matter. It doesn't factor into, right. you know, most common people but mm -hmm. you know there is always ignorant people you know to me 
Well, you know, uh, one of the first things people notice about me is the color of my skin. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? They go, wow, right. you know. And sometimes they'll say something ignorant. If it's a buddy, they'll joke around or something. But it's usually, oh, man, you get any sun? Or, you know, it's always something yeah. silly. So, you know, I, I, it is one of the first things that people notice with me. And, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know if that's gave me a little question. bit different perspective to where, you know, I don't understand why it matters. But, you know, to some people and some people want to say ignorant stupid things and you know i've had a lot of ignorant stupid things said to me totally different you know thing but it's just you know why well, you can't coexist and get along because this is just be friends i don't understand and if you don't like somebody there's a lot of people i don't like of, of, of all the exactly. various you know yeah. creeds and colors so. i saw a quote somewhere and i fail to remember who and where but it basically said white people get yourself some black friends black people get yourself some white friends <laughs> this will squash everything exactly. you that, know? that makes it to, to touch on that yeah subject. go ahead um that makes sense because when i'm from gary indiana like i said and and that's pretty much 100 percent black american mm -hmm. so when I was first introduced to this place, Anya Easley, well, Anya Park said, well, then well, she was Anya Easley. Like Anya Parks <laughs> presently, but Anya Easley then said, um, she said, would you like to um, go and, and purchase a house where I'm from? I said, I said, sure, where are you from? She said, Connorsville. I said, pronounce that again. <laughs> I couldn't even pronounce it. Yeah. So when I first came here, we got the home. I will be honest, growing up around nothing but black American. I didn't even know how to interact mm -hmm. with Caucasians. Mm -hmm. So when I first got here, this was a beautiful place and it was nice and it was comfortable, but I couldn't grasp being here. Yeah. So, and I love her to death. So one day, not even being able to deal with interacting with Caucasians, she went to Indianapolis and I hate I ever did this, but I'm back now though. When she left Indianapolis, I had so much in me, like I'm out of, I'm out of my element. Yeah. So I gathered all my stuff up, got in the car, and just took off. Mm. I just took off, and it, it crushed her. It hurt her heart, and um, I pretty much told her why I did it. It was nothing with, to do with her. It was just I didn't feel comfortable here. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So she said, just try it out. Just come on back. Mm. And I came on back, and I've been here ever since. <laughs> I love Connorsville. I'm not going nowhere. We yeah, we actually had a question come in, and Brandon asks, do you all really think racism is the biggest issue? I don't know if he's I, comparing that to something or... I mean, it, it depends on what you're comparing it to, to be honest, yeah. Brandon. Um, racism is something that's been around. Again, we've talked about it. It's, it's taught. Um, if you look back in the history books, the social, the social studies books, um, you're not going to hear about the great black inventors. You're not going to hear about what African Americans done for this country. Yeah. You're going to hear about what the past Caucasian Americans have done for this country. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to hear about their flaws. You're only going to hear about their victories. Um, so, yes, I believe that, you know, racism is the biggest issue that we're dealing with in America right now. Um, especially like, you know, with George Floyd and everybody and all these innocent African Americans getting killed. We've discussed that there are good law enforcement people. There, there's good on both sides. You know, now the choices that those people made are that of their solely. That's them. That's not to do with the law enforcement. Right. That's not to do with African Americans. It's them and them only. So with that being said, you know, racism goes back and goes back and it's not going to change until something like this happens until you talk about that elephant in the room with your friends and you can uh, you can have black friends and still be racist you know like i i've i <laughs> i know plenty of my friends that you know like oh i like steve but i don't like matt you know like like what you know like what's the difference you know what i'm saying you know and i'm not picking on matt but you know what i mean like it's just it, it's and and i think with me being biracial i see both sides. I have family that's racist. You know, like, I mean, you know, we can't even go to certain functions. When I was younger, we would go and they wouldn't come. They would be in the fields working. You know, so yes, racism is a huge issue. Um, it may not be in your house because you may be Caucasian. You know, so if you're not, if you're not friends or have family members that are African American, then yeah, you, you probably don't deal with it. 
you know, and if you're not racist, good for you. You know, like if you can see wrong, good for you, you know, but then again, you got to talk to your buddies that don't see that. Yeah. You know, you got to you got to help those people that are lost. And that's what I call them lost. And I'm always willing to have a conversation with anybody. It doesn't have to be a confrontation. It has to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and touching bases on it, I think racism is a big, a huge issue. And then not only just dealing with blacks and Caucasians, it's also Mexicans. You know, mm -hmm. people down talk Mexicans, people down talk Puerto Ricans. You have black people. They don't even like black people. You got light, light skin. Yeah, right. you, you got black people that <laughs> oh, yeah. say, "Oh, that black person, that's oh, he's, he's ghetto. He's ghetto." Or you <laughs> have a Caucasian time. person say, "Oh, that's trailer trash." You know what I mean? All that is still racism. You know what I mean? It's yeah. nonstop. Yeah. You know, if we can get over that, then we can, we can start doing a lot of positive things. And that, like one small little thing, I remember. I remember back in the day, my mom told me she, um, when she was little, she walked with Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. She was a little girl. She walked a lot of miles. She said. And um, we was watching the story one day of Martin Luther King. It was on Martin Luther King's birthday. And um, I believe I was probably like seven. And at the end of the show, when he got shot on that balcony, i never forget, I just bust out crying. I ran. I was really mad. My mom said, come here. She brought me back. And she said, what's wrong? I said, they shouldn't have did him like that. And I said, why did they do that? And then she said, it's just, that's just how it is, son. Hopefully we have a change one day. He was up there trying to make a change. So just because he's gone, that don't mean that when you get older, you can live his dream on. You can keep the message going. So anytime I have a chance to bring some people together, I'm there. Anytime somebody want to talk, I'm there. I ain't got nothing but love and, 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 and uh, you know, just love for people, period. No matter what color you is. Wow. You know what I mean? But it, it, it is hard on us as black individuals, especially black men. Um, I hate it just got to be like that. I wish it, it would overcome. But till then, we got to keep doing this to make a, make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I speak on that a you little sure bit? You sure can. Little? Emma, is that okay? <laughs> okay, well, uh, what I wanted to say uh, about it is do we really believe that it's racism? Uh, like I said, you know, hey, I've traveled around the world. I've seen a lot of places and stuff. And I'll give you guys some examples, and I'll tell you what I believe. Um, in Germany, uh, I was stationed there for four years. And it wasn't the young generation. It was the older generation, 60, 65, 70 years old. They, 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 they couldn't coexist with a, a black or or what, uh, uh, whatever nationality dating their German granddaughters or daughters or whatever. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't accept that. But the young generation, there, everything was changing. It wasn't, it wasn't as much racism there. And Kansas City, when I was stationed there for two years, it was a lot of racism. It was still ra a lot of racism there with black and whites. And it was the older generations. In Fort Stewart, Georgia, same, same thing. A lot of racism. But it was the older generation. It was not the young people. And the young people coming up now are being taught by those older people to, the, to, to have racism in, inside of them. And, you know, just, and just give everyone a, a little... Uh, a small example, you know, I'm the disciplinarian and uh, the mentor at Maplewood Elementary School. But now I'll be going to Frazee. Uh, uh, one of the kids, I mean, quite a few of the kids would always, not always, sometimes call another kid the N-word. And, you know, I would bring this kid in and say, hey, what's going on? You know, uh, why are you calling this kid the N-word? I said, uh, do you know what that means? He said, yeah. Or she would say, yeah, I know what that means. I said, well, tell me what it means. They said, well, someone of, of, of color. I said, well, where did you get this from? Mm -hmm. First thing come to their mind is my mom, my dad, using this word. And I said, well, do you have any, uh, I said, black friends? 
They would say yes. I said, do you consider them the N-word? Said no. I said, so who do you consider the N-word? Uh, people they don't like. So they're getting this from their moms and dads. So this is what we have to stop. We have to, as, as, as young people that we see, we have to, um, we have to be able to talk to the young kids. Like I say, police officers that come into school, teachers, everybody. Uh, Chad, Frank, talk to little kids. I mean, when you see them, just talk to them. You know, and just so that we can get to that point that kids are no... Uh, Change their per perceptions. Yeah, exactly. Because when I went to uh, Maplewood, <laughs> some of the kids were looking at me like, I haven't seen a black man like I haven't seen a black man in, in a long time. But I became <laughs> Ever. one of their best friends. <laughs> and the kids over there, when I talked to them at discipline, discipline had a, uh, being disciplined, uh, they was able to commit to me and didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to do things that would disappoint you. It, See this? You can tell this my yeah, wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she's on the back. She's, she, she's reading my mind. I've heard she's this. Like, they did not want to disappoint me at all. So, I, like I tell them, I say, you having a problem? You come and you talk to me. And the kids would always do that. But they're getting this from their parents. That's that, that's all. And like I said, it's the older generation. And I'm gonna give you guys one more story. I'm sorry. I don't know. But yeah. now, my wife, she doesn't even know this story. I was talking to my father-in-law. Can't fill in on this one. I was talking to my father-in-law <laughs> probably about yeah. two weeks ago, and you know, normally him and I we chit chat all the time. And he told me, he said, "Tommy, you know," he said, "Back in the day, he said uh, my uh, my dad would not have pro approved of you being with uh, his granddaughter." Mm. And he told me that, and I said, "Well, you know." I would have tried to win him over, like I want, like I want you. It's like because when I first met Stan, you know, he didn't disapprove of me. He just said, "I want to get to know you." Now, most white fathers, I hope that's what they do when their daughter bring a, a person of color home. Say, "Hey, I want to get to know you first before I make a decision about you." I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have another question for All you. Right. Oh, okay. Not from your suspected people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I Talk didn't catch you, the name, though. Forgive me for that, Emily. Um, but a caller, would, Kim, would like to know what is the Fayette County Sheriff Department doing to teach diversity? Did I get that right? To officers. To uh, Nothing specific um, outside of our normal training that I would say. Um, uh, we just, um, I don't see it as a, an issue for our officers, but um, obviously with what's going on, and, it, you know, I, I'm glad, you know, what Steve said earlier, you know, the, uh, uh, what's going on in the country and the defund the police movement, um, you know, I, I'm not responsible for what happened in uh, Minneapolis. Right. Um, yeah. These officers in this community, and I ask after the George Floyd incident, I sat down with a lot of guys and I said, you know, have you, have you ever seen anything that you deemed racist by another police officer? Mm. Um, something that you went, man, that's that's not right. You're, mm. and, and, and nobody could. One officer from another agency um, shared a story about uh, training with someone, somebody from outside of Connersville, a police officer from outside of Connersville that had had uh, been with a training officer that used the N word on a call, mm. and that was the that was the only story, which is a horrible story. Should never, you know, uh, never happen. Yeah. Good one out of you know. Y yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, and I and I'm not to say, but I've never seen it. Now I've seen um, people that have been arrested call our officers uh, racial terms. Mm. We've had issues in our jail. Uh, from inmates um, not accepting uh, certain uh, races in their blocks. and um, But as far as seeing a police officer do anything, I, I, I haven't seen anything to where I would deem that diversity training would nece necessarily be uh, needed. Um, but it's something, by all means, that I would, uh, you know, be 100% welcome. welcome and open yeah. to. Um, you know, uh, we've had... 
I, I've not had an African American police officer or a deputy at our department. We have had. Have you ever had one apply? I don't think so under my term that I was trying. We've had several work in the jail, but have and, and maybe that's you know from our standpoint maybe maybe don't feel welcome and that, and if that's something on our end I I don't want that and by all means on this to let everybody know mm-hmm. you know uh, anybody's welcome. We're going to select the best police officer. A, a good friend of mine. Um, is Chris Hunt and Chris worked with us at the yes he oh, is yeah. oh he's the best and Chris worked with us when we was at the drug task force he had an office in there and we were talking and Chris said you know guys he said I, he goes I'm not gonna lie to you I got my opportunity because affirmative action he mm-hmm. said that's why I got hired he said and that's why I had to work twice as hard as everybody else mm-hmm. to show them I deserve to be here mm-hmm. and Chris has you know anybody's talked to Chris about right. his right. career he's done a little of everything uh, fantastic work he did for uh, protecting our children in this state but you know um, to hear that you know I, I, I would love I would uh, welcome that opportunity that we could hire somebody I did have a buddy that worked um, a few years ago actually the same buddy mm-hmm. actually from that first story mm-hmm was working at our jail and he was wanting to be a police officer end up going down a little different path but um you know i, I would i would welcome that opportunity because we, we we do need that and we're you know um i keep bringing up stories but um there was an incident that happened at the park um probably four or five years ago and there was a uh caucasian lady that had drove around the pool and had was driving at a high rate of speed i guess picking her kids up and there was a uh family reunion there with uh, with mostly african-american people at the uh it was mine was it was yeah, you there it was, mine. Yeah. was you there yeah okay uh, yeah <laughs> and you can give the other side of the story yeah, yeah yeah so um they came up and it was pretty heated and we got everybody calmed down and kind of just mutually hey everybody go their separate way she's wrong and there were some accusations from a few people there that we did that just because she was white we were letting her go mm-hmm. and she was <laughs> she was quite uh idiotic in the mm-hmm. whole situation but it what we were working fair security is actually what we were doing and it was it was just one of those it's best let's let everybody go and yeah. you know just everybody go their separate ways everybody cool off and there were some accusations that well you guys just let her go and I really, you know, knowing me, you know, and trying to defend my way out of it, I, I feel 100% that I would have made that decision no matter yeah. who was there. Mm-hmm. But the, even that that happened, I wanted to have more dialogue, but the people that got so upset that they just said, oh, yeah. we're gone. Yeah. I thought, well, hang on, you know, and you yeah. immediately go, well, you know, yeah. talk to this friend or this friend, you know. But that's where, you know, sometimes those, uh, the narrative road after that was maybe they felt mm-hmm. that way. And that, it wasn't what happened, yeah. but. You know, we well, gotta be better listeners talk, than that. You know, as yeah. a police officer, how does that make you feel when someone comes to you and say you're doing this because of you know because of the color? Mm-hmm. I mean, does, does that bother yeah. you inside? Oh, as absolutely. a police officer, one hundred percent. Yeah, because I, I I know my integrity and I know how I feel, and it, it just um, well, you who know, your friends are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but to that same yeah. regard, you know, you, you know, they may say. Well, yeah, everybody uses the I got black friends excuse, right, you know, yeah, but yeah. I, Steve probably can speak to my character. I, I've never felt that way. So in that instance, it was like, I don't care what any color. Yeah. If I was blind and I was here, everybody would have got cut loose. Yeah. It was just a silly situation that went. But, yeah, it, it hurts, you know, because I, I don't feel that way at all. But, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, it's it, try to understand the other situation because like the incident you talked about, you know, I don't know what those other folks there, what they had dealt with to lead them to that mm. situation where they felt like, yeah. well, yeah, I see why you're doing that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you got to understand, that's a big thing. We all lose perspective yeah. and, mm-hmm. and think we know everything. Everybody goes to these extreme views. That's why this is so great is everybody got to understand each other. That's, right. you know, all sides. Well, that's the thing, like, is we all live in this world together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and when that whole George Floyd incident happened i lost well i didn't lose them i deleted a lot of friends off my facebook because they're like okay what did he do that i don't care what he did nobody deserves to lose their life you know and you know and when that happens that outrages me you know and i don't care white colored blue pink nobody deserves to lose their life you know and so I had friends that are posting all kinds of just ridiculous stuff from here. And I won't call them out, but they know who they are. 
and I deleted them. And, you know, and the, what's wrong? What's wrong? I thought we were friends. I thought we were too. You know, I thought we were too. Because I know if I'd have been in that situation and that knee would have been on my neck, I would hope as a white friend you would say something. I would hope you'd be outraged. But that's the problem is it doesn't affect them directly. Mm. And until that happens or until, you know, like, for instance, in, you know, my mom's situation, my mom and my dad were one of the first interracial couples here in Indianapolis or in Connorsville. They went through it all. My grandpa was known as a shotgun preacher. He had five daughters and he loaded his shotgun and cleaned it every night. And he would shoot you in a New York minute. He did not care. So my dad was shot at. My stepdad, Keith Parrott, was shot at, you know, um, but it's, the, it's, the, it's like I said, we have to change. We have to have that dialogue to change. I remember we were in McDonald's one night when I was probably six years old, so my brother was probably four, almost five, and that was our ritual. We went to my dad's game. We watched him coach. We went to McDonald's, and then we went to 3D. You remember 3D? Went to 3D oh, yeah. to get a toy. So that was our ritual. Every Saturday, when my dad had a home game. We went in there, we got our McDonald's, sat down, and these women, older women, of course, like Tommy was saying earlier, it's always older people because they're so set in their ways already. They don't, they don't see change. All lives matter. They're always going to tell you that. All lives matter. Well, with the whole Black Lives Matter movement, we're not saying just black, life people, just black people matter. Right. We're not saying that. But all lives can't matter until black lives matter. That's what you fail to realize. And so those women... We're over there making comments, making comments, and my mom, being the person that she is, go ahead and get your stuff together, baby. Let's go ahead and and me and my brother are crying. We're like, why we gotta leave? You know, like we're we're, we're having McDonald's. This is our night out, you know, and we're crying. She's like, I'm so sorry, honey. I'm so sorry, but these ignorant women have ruined our evening. And so, you know, my mom ain't gonna let no nothing, nothing slide. So she walked up to him and she said, I hope you're proud of yourself. You know, you ruined our evening out. And those women were like, well, you got these mongoloid children out here. Wow. And my mom was like, mongoloid? She's like, are you serious? She's like, do you even, can you spell mongoloid? You know, and the women were just like, uh. And so she's like, well, you know, of course, said the N-word. And so my mom's like, well, if you look up the N-word in the dictionary, you're actually the N-word. You're the trash. You're the trash. If you look it up in the dictionary... It means trash. It doesn't mean black. It doesn't mean white. It doesn't mean pink. It means trash. So my mom walked out, and we went into 3D, got our toy, went home, and, of course, had a long conversation, you know. And, uh, but like I said, you know, things like that mold a young child. Yeah. And I forever hated Pentecostal people. Wow. I hated them. You wow. know, like I, because that's what they were. They had skirts. Their hair was up, you know, and. And I was just like, I, and so it made me hate those people, even mm. though I never knew any Pentecostal people, mm. you know? And then once I got older, I was like, okay, they were just ignorant. It wasn't Pentecostal people. It's just those people, That's right. you those know? Two. And so yeah. you have to learn in life, you're going to come across several different people and you're going to have several different reactions out of all those people. And you have to take the good and leave the bad. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, to that note, a lot of what, has been alluded to in conversation um, is perception and biases. You know, we all have our own perceptions. We all have biases that aren't factual. Right. And we, like you said, you're forming a bias and a perception about that group of people based on that one experience. And how often do we all do that, no matter who we are, based on an experience? And it really takes a lot of teaching and education of parents in those moments to say, don't you know, categorize all right. people based on that experience. And we all need to do that. So that's a really good example. Yeah. Um, we have another question um, specifically for um, you two, I think, and put maybe Tommy, even though he's talked a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you have had white friends in school, say high school, middle school, and racial jokes are sort of accepted potentially, like as it, they're going on, mm -hmm. And then later on, those things would bother you. Is that is that something you've experienced? Me personally, as I said, coming from Gary, Indiana, 100% black American. So I've never been in that predicament. My son, on the other hand, um, Xavier, he has. And he had come and tell me, to be truthful, he was going to 
Is that Maplewood? Mm -hmm. he's, he's going to Maplewood. And he suffered so much racist comments from, from kids. I mean, these kids, one, another thing, I'm going to get back to that, but we have to start training our and teaching our kids better. It's so many kids out here in Connersville that I'm noticing they cuss more than us put right. together. Exactly. It's, it's, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's crazy. But that's another story. So <laughs> my son, he comes home and, and he's just nonstop. It's just, he's like, it's nonstop, Dad. I mean, Mom, it's nonstop. So we took him to Grandview. So now he's at Grandview. He loved Grandview. But yeah, he would come home and he would tell me some of the stories and then it just makes him so, so mad. He don't even like someone singing a song with a thousand N-words in the song. He, he, don't, he don't want you to do it around him, especially if you're a Caucasian. He's just, it's just in his mind. So he is really gun-ho about no racism, you know what I mean? And, and when it comes his way, as it has came his way, it's still coming his way. It's like he was just in an altercation just the just, just other day, and these kids' mouths. But anyway, he faced it, and it makes him so mad, and he gets so angry. And then I have to sit him down and have these conversations with him when I shouldn't even be having these conversations with him. We should not still be facing this same situation that my, that my ancestors been facing. I mean, it's, 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 it's enough is enough, you know? And, and I, I should be having time, I should be finding time to train him on his basketball, his dribbling, his, his, his education. But no, I still got to go back in time again and, and go over all this stuff when he should be learning all of this, but I don't have time to teach him this because he's still stuck on why is I'm getting called the N-word. So I can't even get to this point, but this point. So when we eliminate this, I can start teaching my kids, and you can start teaching your kids what they actually need to know mm -hmm. to grow up, to provide for their family. As far as, like, uh, jokes and stuff like that, I've, I've been around, you know, and, you know, and I, and, I mean, I used to put people in lockers for using <laughs> the N-word for, or for even coon, anything, anything that I did means <laughs> derogatory, I'm... I learned to fight at Maplewood. I was a fighter. I liked to fight. Mm. So when you spit on me or you call me a chocolate bar or whatever, anything, zebra, I'm fighting. You know, and mm. I wish there were some teachers from Maplewood that were here because they would tell you, I would knock people out. You know, like I did not play about that. My parents told me, you know, if somebody disrespects you, they put their hands on you, take care of it. And then, like I said, the next day they'd be, hey, let's be friends, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, but don't ever step out of line again, you know, and with those jokes and stuff, like, like you were saying, these kids nowadays use the N word, like it's tennis shoes, Everybody Ooh. uses you know, it, yeah. like, and I'm like, whoa, yo, whoa. And I, and I tell my younger nephews and cousins and stuff like that. Hey, don't let that ride. You know mm -hmm. how many fights I've got in to, to protect you from hearing that, mm -hmm. you know, and then you go around and you let your friends use it so freely. You know, like, that's not okay with me. And you, like you said, I don't even allow that. Um, I'm playing music. I, you know, I don't say it. So I don't want my boys growing up saying it. Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody around me saying it. And if you say it around me, I'm more than likely I'm going to slap a taste out your mouth. <laughs> you know, that's just the kind of person I am. I don't, I don't care about those repercussions that are going to come along with that. But I'm going to teach you some respect. So I you, to cut, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. That's okay. okay, so one more thing. So... And so now we have we all know that Maplewood is closing down and they the kids have to be divided to here and there. I don't know what's going on in the other other schools, but I know that the kids at Maplewood was they say some very de derogatory things. And hopefully the parents that's knowing that their kids doing that, please don't send them to this other school. Um, to Grandview, right? Yeah, to, to Grandview. Right. There's, there's good kids there. Yeah. Don't send them there <laughs> to trouble them kids. Them kids trying to learn. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, though, back to this, the, the, the kind of idea which you said you're not, you're not accepting that as a friendly joke and then later being bothered. So, right. Yeah. Um, That's I not, think, it's not friendly to me. Like, you know, like if you, if you can so freely make jokes about black people, like I've never, you know, like what did, what did the Caucasian say to the other Caucasian? I mean, like, what? You know, like it's, yeah. not, you know, it's not funny. You know, and, and what, what's the first great, thing they say? I'm just playing. Yeah, you're just not playing. just playing. I think yeah. in great part, though, part of it is the music, and yeah. that there are the, all of the white kids are listening to that music with that language, yeah. and um, 
they use that freely amongst each other. White yeah. girl to white girl. I heard it when I worked at the high school, and I'm like, excuse me? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. What are you calling each other? Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's becoming a little bit loose lips mm -hmm. to me. Um, and then and because chips. you <laughs> are free in that speech, mm -hmm. or I don't think people even know their kids are talking like that, I'll be honest. I would oh, be shocked no. if some of those kids' parents knew that. Mm -hmm. But be, I, in part, do think that the music represents the society to a great deal. And I saw a commentary on that. I actually watched it last night. And, um, you know, what was the music 50 years ago? Right. Oh, I've got yeah. sunshine on a cloudy day. Yeah. <laughs> and what is it now? Yeah. Top song. We can't yeah. even quote here. <laughs> so, you know, if, if, that's, if that's representative of the problem to me, yeah. um, and it's difficult to manage that on a on their level. Right. Because um, I, don't, I, really, I don't know how to fix that um, because everybody's making money off the wrong thing. So Well, that's the thing, I too. Is music, music is going to be, you know, music was invented to help you take away your sorrows and to, to help you feel joy to and vent. to help you, yeah, to vent, to, to get your, you know, to what's going on with you. That's making people relate. mad now. And then now, you know, like you, like you said, there's a lot of, like, I, that time I can't even understand it. Like, I, I told my son, don't turn that on. Don't turn that mess on because I don't want to hear, you know, like if, if it's talking about, you know, derogatory towards, you know, us and derogatory towards women and, mm -hmm. and God and this and that, yeah. you know, that's not something that's mm -hmm. going to benefit your life. You know, when you listen to, for instance, like when you listen to uh, Smokey Robinson, when you listen to, you know, like Ohio players, you know, people like that, it's a melody. It, it, you know, it calms you down and it's, it's like, okay, ah, oh, yeah, okay, everything's okay. Mm -hmm. But if I go and I put Rage Against the Machine on, you know, like, then I'm like, ah, you know, like, it, it changes, it your changes mood. your mood. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. so these kids are not smart enough to know music is just that. It's music. Yeah. That's not you. Mm -hmm. The streets, you ain't about that life. You know, yeah. deflate your chest because you're not tough. You know, yeah. like, you can't go out and y'all, oh, I heard Tech 9 say this, so I'm going to go and I'm going to say it at school and see what happens. Tech 9 is Tech 9. You are Billy. Stay, stay being Billy. Don't try to be Tech 9. <laughs> stay in your lane. Don't try to be, you know, yeah, yeah, you're not them people. You know, like, it's not for you. Yeah. Well, we have about three more minutes, okay. I think. So I was going to mention the music of your day, but it was so clean and pure. Smoke. Yes, it was. Smoke it yeah. Yeah. Smoke it yeah. 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 Yes, indeed. Yeah. Hey, but you know, they, uh, Imperials. you know, <laughs> speaking of the uh, situation about uh, the school and um, people, uh, you know, joking about race and stuff like that. Um, first, in my freshman year, I went to an all-black high school that had 3,000 students. I didn't have that problem. Then I transferred to a, 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 a private high school that had uh, 80 in the class. And it was a college prep high school. Very smart kids, including myself, of course. Uh, but anyway. You have only one uh, okay, okay, the story. This, man, now you're making me nervous. Okay. Me nervous. Now, the, the story is here. that I told my mom that these kids was calling me the M word and stuff like that. I went to the principal, told the principal. The principal said, I'll take care of it. A week later, they didn't take care of it. They called me the N-word again. So I went to my basketball coach and the principal again. They didn't take care of it. So I went to my mom, and my mom went up and talked to the teacher and the, uh, my basketball coach. And my mom told the uh, principal that, listen, we need to get this problem fixed. If we can't get it fixed, then she's going to go to the board of education or the superintendent to talk to them because we got to get it fixed. So if the kids are having problems, then this is what they need to do have their parents go up to the school and, and, and talk to the superintendent. If the principal, and if they're not doing, I can't, if they're not doing their jobs to stop these, the other kids from calling these kids bad words, you know, whatever it is, then it stops there with them. If the kids come to you and say, hey, can you please make Billy stop calling me the N word? He's coming to you and sometimes they come to you in confidence. And that need to stop right there. It doesn't need to go any further. But a lot of times, principals have a lot on their plates, mm -hmm. and they can't do it. And they might forget. But then, if they forget, you're going to start a fight. A kid going to knock out another kid. That's when we're going to have a problem. 
So we need to get all this fixed and stuff. Let's, let's go through the proper channels. The kid must first tell the principal, or tell the teacher, tell the principal, and after that, go to your parent, tell your parent, have your parent go up there, have a meeting with those two, and the superintendent, or the assistant superintendent, if you have to. Because we have to get that problem fixed. And there's lots of good kids yeah. in Fayette County. Yeah. So of course. We yeah. will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us.